Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Pandemic Dialogues, Conversations in Civic Crisis. This is our new virtual seminar series to provide perspective on our current public health and civic crisis through conversations among our school's faculty and students and expert guests and a wider community. I'm Paul Caris, Director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. Part of our school's mission is to promote civic dialogue about pressing issues of our time. And throughout each academic year, we host a speaker series, the Civic Discourse Project, which extends the conversations and debates from our classrooms to a broader community. Arizona PBS records all of those speaker events and broadcasts them. Given today's new normal, we had to postpone our final two lecture events of the year until the fall. You can visit our website to see all of our previous lectures in the Civic Discourse Project at scetl.asu.edu. We are offering the pandemic dialogues in two different modes, a series of live webinars, each discussing a great work or a deeper perspective on pandemics and civic crisis, and also a podcast discussing Camus' novel, The Plague. More information on both modes of the pandemic dialogues are available again on our website. You can also find more information on the school, scetl.asu.edu. Now I'm delighted to welcome our two panelists, Professor Ian Moulton of the College of Integrated Sciences and Arts here at Arizona State University, and from our own school of civic and economic thought and leadership, Teresa Smart. We will have three parts to tonight's webinar, an opening presentation from Professor Moulton, and questions for him from Teresa Smart and myself. And in part three, a question and answer session from our virtual community that's joining us. So we ask you please to type your questions using the Q&A feature in the Zoom. Our colleague Luke Perez will be collecting those and channeling them to Teresa Smart and myself. You can also use the hashtag pandemic dialogues on Twitter to participate in our discussion as well. Our guest is Ian Frederick Moulton, a professor of English and cultural history in the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts at Arizona State University. He's a cultural historian and a literary scholar who's published widely on the representation of gender and sexuality in early modern European literature. His most recent book from 2014 is Love in Print in the 16th Century, The Popularization of Romance. Joining me to grill him with questions is Teresa Smart, an assistant professor here in our school where she teaches ancient and medieval political philosophy. Her primary research interests explore the ethics and citizenship discussed in the thought of Thomas Aquinas with a view to alleviating tensions between political commitments on the one hand and deeply held moral or religious beliefs on the other. Prior to joining us in the faculty at ASU, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the James Madison program at Princeton University. So Professor Moulton, thank you so much for joining us. We now look forward to your opening presentation on Boccaccio and the Decameron, this extraordinary work he wrote immediately in the aftermath of the Great Plague, the Black Death in 14th century Europe. Okay, uh, so I'll just, I'll just be talking for a few minutes about Boccaccio's life, about the Decameron, about the plague, and how all these things kind of come together. Um, Boccaccio was uh, born outside of Florence in Italy in the early 14th century, and uh, he, he has a kind of interesting sort of social position from a lot of points of view, and I think if we're thinking about sort of where he's coming from, it's good to think about uh, uh, sort of what his position in society was. He was born the son of uh, a business person, a, a kind of a banker, uh, but he was an illegitimate child. So he was accepted by his father, but he was born out of wedlock. Um, he grew up in a banking family. Florence was a great city for banking and commerce in the 14th century. It was one of the richest cities in Italy, especially uh, around the wool trade. Trade in fabric was a big deal. And so Boccaccio grew up in a, um, you know, in a well-off uh, sort of business atmosphere, a mercantile atmosphere with his father and his family being engaged in trade. But what happened when he was a young man uh, was that he and his father went to Naples and he spent uh, many years in Naples as a young man, 
And Naples at that time was not a commercial city. It was an aristocratic city. It was very wealthy. It was very beautiful. Uh, the court there was at a very high level of culture. And, and Boccaccio sort of lived this life in a kind of aristocratic court culture in Naples where he got a magnificent education. He uh, did a lot of work in canon law. His father wanted him to be a banker. Boccaccio didn't really like banking. Uh, his father wanted him to then maybe be a, a church lawyer, a canon lawyer. Uh, Boccaccio didn't, didn't really want to do that either. Uh, what he did do was he spent a lot of time writing poems about romantic love and courtly love. And I think this uh, will have uh, some impact on some of the things that we'll be talking about later. So he's living, he's, he's an illegitimate child. So he's sort of on the outside from that. He comes from a merchant family. So he's a little on the outside from that, but he's participating in this aristocratic court culture in Naples. And that is a very luxurious place to be. And he's part of that society, but he's not really of it. And uh, so at a certain point around 1340, his father moves back to Florence for various reasons and basically goes broke. <laughs> and Boccaccio also moves back to Florence and all of a sudden he's not in this court culture anymore. He's kind of struggling. He's, he's not part of this very sort of wealthy aristocratic world that he grew up feeling part of. And then, uh, what happens in 1348 is the thing that no one can predict and the reason that we're having this discussion today, there is a horrible pandemic of bubonic plague that sweeps all through Europe. Uh, it seems to have arrived from the East. Uh, there, there's good evidence that it, uh, it did a lot of damage in places like Persia and India before it even got to Europe. And when it gets to Europe, it's absolutely devastating. I'll talk a little bit about what the Black Death is, a so-called bubonic plague, Black Death. Um, it is a bacterial infection that uh, transmits itself in several ways. The primary way, uh, as far as people can tell, is that uh, it lives in fleas that uh, infest rats. And rats are everywhere. Rats are still everywhere. We don't necessarily see them every day, but if there are people, there are rats. And definitely in the 14th century, if there were people, there were rats. And the fleas travel on the rats, they collect the bacteria inside them, and then they bite people. So you get a flea bite, which it was a very common thing in uh, 14th century Europe, the kind of thing that like getting a mosquito bite now, it's something you wouldn't think much of. Oh, wow, itch, flea bite, yuck. Um, this disease, though, is absolutely devastating. It uh, viciously and violently and very forcefully attacks the lymphatic system, the, the body system for sort of protecting itself from disease, one of the sort of main structures in the immune system. And it totally overwhelms the lymphatic system. It travels throughout the body. Uh, what it does is it creates these pockets of infection and hemorrhaging within the lymph nodes. And the lymph nodes are found in the groin, uh, under the chin, and in the armpits. And what would happen is these horrible black sort of uh, pus and blood-filled uh, sacs would start growing around the lymph nodes. And people would have horrible fevers. They would have splitting headaches. And after a day or so of this, the sacs would burst and the people would, would die very shortly afterwards. Now, that, that sounds horrible, and, and it is. That was the good form of bubonic plague. That only killed 40 to 70% of people infected. The other thing that would happen was that it would move to the lungs and create hemorrhaging in the lungs, and then there would be a lot of coughing and spitting up blood. The lung form, the form that infected the lungs was 100% fatal. If you got it, you died and it spread through the air through droplets. And I think we're all <laughs> dealing with coronavirus. We realize how scary it is when something spreads through the air through droplets. Uh, what makes all of this a million times even worse is that the people at the time had no knowledge of anything that I've just described. Uh, this, this disease came upon them in ways that they absolutely didn't understand. They understood that uh, living in groups and being in a crowd was bad. They thought there might be something to do with bad air. They thought it might be better to get into the country than be in a city, but that was mostly just to get away from other people. 
And what they did realize is when people got sick, they very quickly died. Um, so what does this have to do with Boccaccio? Well, we don't know where Boccaccio was when the Black Death hit, but it hit all over, uh, all over Italy. And in devastating numbers, the, the mortality rates are, the conservative estimate of the mortality rate is 30% of the population died. That's not 30% infection, that's 30% dead. Uh, the less conservative rates are 50% of the population died. Uh, so this is just absolute horrific stuff. Um, Boccaccio says in the Decameron that he witnessed the plague and he describes the plague in Florence. We don't know for absolute sure if he was in the city of Florence during the plague. We do know that he survived and he doesn't say anything about how he survived. And he doesn't say anything in the Decameron about his own experience of the plague. He just says that he experienced it. So what's the Decameron? Well, it's a collection of stories that Boccaccio writes immediately after the plague. He's finished writing it by 1352. Uh, and the plague hit in 1348. So within four years of the plague, he's written this, you know, depends uh, how long is the account. It's a hundred stories. And the stories are all two to three to 10 pages long. It's, it's a substantial book, uh, almost a thousand pages in, in a contemporary paperback. So this is a major undertaking. We don't know how many of the stories he had written before. We don't know if he conceived of writing the book before the plague. But what he does at the beginning of the book is he says, I'm writing this book to cheer up women. He says, I'm writing it because women live sad lives. They are often confined to their houses. They don't get out much. And they, they often get depressed. They, they're interested in love, but they're not necessarily able to have relationships or whatever. And so they have all this curiosity about love. So I've written all these stories to cheer up these women who are, who are you know, leaving, living lives that don't allow them certain kinds of freedom. Um, so what, uh, what Boccaccio does is he sets up uh, this, this frame tale to the stories. And he says, well, here's what happened. I'm going to tell you all these happy stories, but to get to the happy stories, he says, we have to go to a very bad place first. We have to go through a kind of sadness to get to the happiness. And the sadness is the plague. And the thing that makes the Decameron interesting for us now in terms of our own situation is that Boccaccio writes a fairly detailed description about maybe 10 pages long, uh, which if you've done the reading that we circulated with this, you've read it. It's a description of the plague in Florence. Um, and in some ways it's very accurate. He describes the way that bubonic plague affects people. He describes the swiftness of, of the symptoms. He describes the fact that if you get this, you're very likely dead. Uh, this is all detailed. We know that, you know, he's writing in a, um, he's writing in a culture that very much values examples and writing things properly and following the rules. And so one of the things he does is he, he bases his account of the plague on previous accounts of the plague. Uh, those of you who were part of the Thucydides discussion uh, that was already in this series, Boccaccio is, is probably aware of the, the, description of the Athenian plague in Thucydides and because he's a Greek scholar and he's looking at it. But he's also looking at a text written in Latin by a man named John the Deacon who described a plague that hit Europe in the sixth century. And it, the John the Deacon's plague seems to have been bubonic plague and he describes the symptoms the same way Boccaccio does. And I just bring this up because uh, his, Boccaccio's description is so vivid that we often think it's a kind of journalistic eyewitness account. And that's not really what he's doing. He is doing that, but he's also using former literary models. And if John the Deacon wrote a good description of what a plague is like, then Boccaccio will base his on that. That's the standard practice in the 14th century for writing properly, as you base yourself on prior models. So we can't really take Boccaccio's description as a journalistic account. It's a literary account, but it's a very accurate literary account, and it reflects the reality of what the plague was. Um, if you've read the account uh, of the plague from the Decameron that we circulated uh, prior to our meeting today, you'll see that the thing that upsets Boccaccio the most is the breakdown of social order and of social bonds. He's, he notes that uh, you know, the first people that rush to help the sick are the doctors, the medical professionals who try to give medical help, and then the clergy who administer last rites or bring spiritual help and he notes that 
This is devastating to both those communities. The doctors and the clergy die from being in contact with the sick. And that what this means is that neither medical knowledge nor the spiritual structure of the church is of much help to anyone. Priests are not there giving last rites. Uh, families often desert family members, even, and Boccaccio you know, records this with a certain amount of horror. It, uh, husbands desert wives, parents desert children, children desert parents. Uh, once someone's sick, you leave them and they die on their own. Or you, if you go with them, you'll die too and everyone will leave both of you. So this kind of breakdown in social structure is something that Boccaccio finds very troubling. And uh, one of the things that he focuses on a lot, which I think is typical of a traditional society like 14th century Florence, is he focuses on the, uh, the collapse of the rituals surrounding death. People are not being properly buried. People are being buried in mass graves. People are being buried without a proper burial procession to the church. People are being buried um, without proper prayers being said by by people who are authorized to say those prayers. And our culture, um, I think it's fair to say compared to other cultures and compared to traditional cultures, we hide death a lot. People die in hospitals, uh, then their bodies are taken to funeral homes. Uh, if we see the body again after that, it's because we make arrangements for the body to be sort of prepared by professionals. And all of this is utterly alien to 14th century Europe. In 14th century Europe, Funeral processions are very public. They take place in the streets of the parish. Uh, one of the things that very much upsets Boccaccio is that people aren't buried in the church they choose. They're buried in the most convenient church to put them in. And uh, this may, might not be something that would bother us that much if someone was buried in one church rather than another. But the idea that you, your final resting place is not going to be in your parish church or that it's not going to be in you know, the church where you were married and that is the church where you attend services. This is something that upsets him quite a bit. Um, and the, the other thing he's upset about is that mourning isn't, it's not just the, the rituals of the church. He says, there are no women crying over these corpses. People are just dead. And, and in this, in Boccaccio's society, when someone dies, you have a ritual of mourning where the women of the family wash the body, they clean it, they dress it, uh, and they cry over it. They, they, they have outbursts of real grief, but they also chant prayers, chant lamentations, and make this kind of um, sort of formal social acknowledgement of, of a person's passing. None of this is happening in the plague, and this is something that, that upsets Boccaccio very much. Uh, he also looks at a kind of so, uh, what we would think of as a kind of sociological approach where he looks at different reactions people have, and I'll just quickly outline those. He says there are three ways that people respond to the, the plague. One is some people shut themselves up in their houses, uh, make sure they've got lots of good food and lots of good wine, and they try to live a healthy life in their house. They drink in moderation, they eat good food, and they shut their doors and just hope it all goes by. Uh, the second group of people, he says, totally reject this. And what they do instead is they get drunk, uh, they, they figure, well, you know, we're all going to die anyway, and we may all die soon, might as well have a good time. They run around like nuts in the street, they scream, they shout, they party, they, uh, you know, they, and they, they just sort of go wild as a kind of way of saying, we don't care about the plague, we're going to ignore the plague, we're going we're gonna to just, uh, we're going to just do whatever we want to do. So, um, that's one, that's the second response. The third response, he says, there are some people who try to go about their daily lives and they, uh, they carry things around with them, uh, flowers or sweet smelling herbs or something so that the stench of the dead bodies and the stench of, of the disease doesn't affect them. And they try to get through as best they can. And he, he notes this as sort of three different psychological approaches. One is to shut yourself off. One is to go wild uh, and do things that you, you wouldn't normally do. And the third is to sort of get on with your life and try to do it. He then says sort of despairingly that this doesn't seem to help, <laughs> that all three groups see death among them, that even the people who shelter in their homes, there's the, the disease gets in somehow, either someone was sick before or you know the house gets infected somehow. The people who are drinking and partying, well, they're, they're just asking to get sick. And the people who try to, you know, they, they are walking around the streets with their sweet smelling herbs, doesn't really help. And 
you know, the despair that he feels that then that none of the sort of social things that should work work. He also says that uh, things are just as bad in the countryside as in the city. You would think they would be worse in the city, but in the countryside, people are dying in the fields. Uh, he, he points out that even animals get the plague, so the distinctions between human and animal are not being sort of observed. All sort of distinctions in society are breaking down. And at this point, he goes into fiction. And what he says is, well, when things were in this horrible state, there were seven young women from good households, good girls, uh, clean living, respectable women, but they found themselves alone. They didn't have, you know, their brothers and their fathers and their mothers weren't there. And they went to the church of Santa Maria Novella, which is a big church in Florence. It's now near the train station. Boccaccio lived long before the train station, but the church is still there. Um, and uh, they met three young men there that they knew and that they also honorable, good young men from good homes. And what they decided, the 10 of them, was that they needed to go somewhere to get away from all the misery. And one of them had a place in the hills. And so they went up to her place in the hills and she had a beautiful villa in the hills above Florence near Fiesoli. And uh, that's where they decided to live. They decided they would just create a world outside of Florence uh, and they would live there in the villa. They would eat well, they would exercise, they would take care of their bodies, they would take care spiritually. They would take one day a week, it's Friday, to observe religious observances. They would take Saturday as a day to sort of make sure that they were healthy and clean. And the other five days of the week, they would tell each other stories. They would tell 10 stories a day. There's 10 of them. And at the end of two weeks, with five days on and two days off, that would give them 10 days of storytelling for 100 stories. Each day, there would be one person in the group who would be elected king or queen. And that person would organize the storytelling for the day, maybe assign a theme. Some of the days have themes, some don't. And they would structure the conversation. And so for the rest of the Decameron, the plague world kind of recedes. And where we are is in this kind of aristocratic um, oasis where these young people can tell each other stories. And they tell a wide, wide variety of stories. Um, most of the stories have something to do with love, but not all of them do. Uh, some of the stories deal with how people can trick and fool each other. Uh, intelligence is always a virtue in these stories. Some of the stories deal with noble people and so on, uh, but some of the stories also deal with very humble people, with merchants, with beggars, with uh, peasants, with travelers, uh, with craftspeople. And so one of, the, one of the sort of cultural values that the Decameron has as a collection of stories is it is a collection of stories of daily life. And uh, it has a wide social range. These are not stories, and they're, the stories tend to be, there are some stories with magical elements, but the stories tend to be stories that actually could happen. They're not stories about dragons and witches and wizards, by and large. They're stories about uh, families and people, and they tend to take place in real places. Some of them are more realistic than others. Scholars have looked at where, Boccaccio didn't make up all these stories, of course. He, he collected them. Some of them come from all over the Mediterranean. There are some that we know are part of uh, uh, story collections in the Arab world, like the Thousand and One Nights. There are some stories that come from India. There are stories from all over Europe. Uh, Boccaccio was living in Naples. He lived in Florence. These are cities that have connections to a broader world. And so he's bringing in uh, a sort of cross-cultural collection of, of tales uh, some of the stories have Jewish main characters. Some of them have Muslim main characters. Most of them are set within the Christian world of, uh, of Boccaccio's Italy. Um, and so this is the collection that, that makes up the Decameron. Um, I'll just say a little bit, we're, we're sort of getting to the end of the time for my piece of this. I'll just say a little bit about Boccaccio's later life. Uh, the Decameron was not like anything that he'd written before. Before that, he'd written mostly courtly poems, not sort of down-to-earth stories. And he'd written in poetry rather than prose. Uh, the Decameron is really the first great work of Italian prose narrative. Some people would say it was the first great work of vernacular prose narrative anywhere in Europe. Uh, 
later in life, Boccaccio shifts to Latin and writes scholarly works. He becomes more of a scholar. He writes collections of biographies of famous women, uh, collections of classical myths about the pagan gods, uh, collections of stories about uh, sort of tragic stories of leaders who, uh, who come to a bad end. Uh, he seems to have become more religious as he grew older. Uh, later in life, one of the things he did write in Italian was a kind of anti-feminist uh, dialogue called Corbaccio, which means the crow. And it's basically uh, a short text that blames women for every bad thing in life and advises young men to steer clear of women and their enticements. Uh, it's very different than the take on women in the Decameron. Uh, and uh, we know that Boccaccio took minor orders uh, late in life. He, would, he never took full, he didn't become a priest, but he took minor orders and he may have served as a deacon in some of the churches. So he definitely, uh, he definitely in that sense, was bringing himself uh, closer into the, the business of the church than he had as a, as a younger man. Uh, and he never, he kept, re he kept sort of putting out uh, editions of the Decameron throughout his life and he never, you know, he never rejected it in any way, but he also never followed it up. He didn't do another work like that. He moved to different kinds of work and, and uh, went in a different direction with his life. So that, uh, that gives us some background, I think, for sort of what the Decameron is, uh, how the plague narrative fits into it, and how, how it fits into sort of Boccaccio's, the larger picture of Boccaccio's life. So uh, I, can, I can stop there with that and we can, we can go to questions. Great, thank you so much, Ian. Uh, it's interesting how many parallels there are to Thucydides' account, but of course, differences. And then it was not nearly as devastating. It, what we're going through is not nearly as devastating to a whole social order as, uh, you know, you helped us to understand the Black Death, why it's called. <laughs> well, we, we uh, remind everybody that you're welcome to submit questions for part three of our webinar, um, use the Q&A function in Zoom to type your questions. But now for part two, we have questions from uh, my colleague, Teresa Smart and ourself. And Teresa won the coin toss, so she asked the opening question to you. Yes, thank you so much for this wonderful introduction, Professor Moulton. Um, as you mentioned, the stories of the Decameron have two narrative frames. In the author's introduction, Boccaccio offers the entire work as a sucker and a refuge for those who are in love. But then the bubonic plague appears in the second narrative introduction, framing the stories. The one where the plague grot devastation in Florence motivates the 10 young people to shelter in place in the countryside. But to me, it's actually a little curious that this is the plague's only appearance. There's no plague in the stories, just hilarious human foils and foibles and debauchery and deceptions and love affairs and other such themes of human interest. So my question for you is, why is Boccaccio's frame story about the plague significant to the rest of the narrative? How does this background setting relate to the content of the stories and how should it color the way that we interpret them? That's a great question, and it, it gets into all sorts of interesting issues. Um, one of the things we know is that Boccaccio was a huge fan of Dante, who had written the Divine Comedy, his, his journey through the afterlife. Uh, and Boccaccio was the next generation after Dante. Dante died in 1321, and Boccaccio was born in 1310. So Boccaccio was just a child when Dante died. But he, he, he seems to have been looking at the Divine Comedy as a kind of counter model to the Decameron. You can't do Dante again. I mean, he, he did it so well. So what do you do? Well, the Divine Comedy opens up in the middle of Dante's life. Now, mezzo de camin de nostra vita is the first line. In the middle of our life, I found myself in a dark wood. And people will, people who study Boccaccio will point out that Boccaccio is about 35 when he writes the Decameron and the plague is the dark wood. He finds himself in the dark wood. Well, Dante in the, in the Divine Comedy, to get out of the dark wood, he has to travel through hell and purgatory to heaven with Virgil guiding him. Boccaccio does something different. What he does instead of that is he, he turns his back on the plague and creates a world that, that uh, a fiction that celebrates life. Hmm. There's a world of death in the city in Florence and people are dying. 
So what Boccaccio does is he leaves the city behind and goes to the countryside and not just the countryside, it's not the wilderness, it's not a farm, it's a garden. And the garden is a place where nature is made better through human work. Mm -hmm. A garden is not natural. A garden uses the material of nature to create something that's better than nature. This is the theory of gardens in Boccaccio's time. And the idea that they're in a garden, uh, I think that fits with what he's doing. He's taking the, the material of human life. He's taking love, sexual desire, all those things. And through the stories, he's making something better of it, just like you would make, uh, you would take plants and you don't just have them be a dangerous wilderness, you create a beautiful garden. I think that's how he sees the Decameron. He gives it order, he gives it structure. Uh, some of the stories are funny, some of the stories are tragic. Um, he says at various points, there are three points in the text where he sort of gives a defense of what he's doing. There's a point at the very beginning where he introduces it and says, this is what the book's about. Uh, there's a point before the beginning of day four where he says, oh, a lot of people are complaining that I write this book about ladies, but actually I think it's a valid book to write. And then at the end, he has a sort of final defense of the book. And in the final defense, he says, look, I wrote this book to cheer people up. I wrote this book to write about things that are happy. Uh, if, you, if you find that you are too happy, uh, you should read Jeremiah you should read the accounts of the passion in the gospels and you th that will give you something serious to think about this is not something serious to think about this is to cheer you up uh, and so he's using these stories about about love and he also says and this is standard literary theory at the time he says you know my stories are like a fire fire is good if you're cold and you need a fire to cook your food and to get you through the night have a fire if fire burns your house down not so good uh, you need to manage the fire. You need to you need to know how to use the fire for good and not for bad. And he says, well, you know, a good person reading my stories is going to is going to get good things from them. They're going to see the crazy things people do in these stories. They're going to do. I'm never going to do that. Uh, a bad person is going to take the story and do a bad thing because that's what a bad person does. And you know that in some senses this is this is a good excuse. But I think he's serious about the idea that what he's doing is he's presenting stories about human life not about the afterlife like Dante, but about human life. And humans are sinful. Humans do all sorts of horrible things. The question is, what do you build out of it? What do you make out of it? Uh, how do you construct something spiritually or socially useful out of the sort of raw material of human desire? And that is what he seems to be arguing that he's doing in the Decameron, that he's taking these stories. And, and this is a place, I don't want to go on too long with this, but this is a place that I think the first story of the Decameron, which we also gave you to read uh, if, you, if you did the reading, is useful because the first story is a story about Ser Chapoletto, who is the most evil man who ever lived. He's a horrible murderer, liar, cheat, just a dreadful human being. And he is visiting some uh, associates far from Italy uh, in, in the Netherlands and he gets sick and he's dying. And his associates are terrified because, because he's dying, he has to have a priest confess him. And when he confesses, they're going to hear all the horrible things he did and they're gonna hate the people who have taken him in and fed him and you know, made him their guest. And they talk to him and they say, do you have, you know, you're gonna confess all your sins, what's gonna to happen to us? And he says, I got this for you. And so he lies to the priest and he pretends to be, because he's a good liar, he pretends to be the best person who's ever lived. He pretends that he's very, very sorry because once he felt ungrateful towards his mother and he, he, he says all these horrible things. And he says, oh, you know, one time I spit in the church, I, I wasn't thinking and the, the priest's like, oh, we do that all the time, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, and he, he goes through this thing. But what, what's interesting is what happens is the priest is a total sucker. The priest does not see through any of it and just goes, oh, oh, this poor man. Oh, oh, my, my child, don't be sad. And, you know, does all these things to comfort horrible Ser Chapoletto and Ser Chapoletto dies. But what happens out of this? What happens out of this is people are so impressed with Ser Chapoletto's, the, the fictional character they created, the good person, that he becomes a local saint and becomes a model for good behavior in the community. And there are two ways to read this story. One way is to say, oh, the priest's an idiot. And this evil man pulled one over on him and yeah, he, he lived his evil life and he, he dies lying to the priest. What a horrible thing. What good is the church? The other way to read it is this is the most evil man in the world and out of this comes good. 
people are people are it, and it's not through the agency of the priest it's through the sort of larger destiny of god or, or providence that takes this evil man and his evil lies and turns it into a model of good behavior which actually causes people to do good in the community and that i think is a good allegory for sort of how boccaccio is treating the subject matter of his tales uh he's telling stories about all sorts of crazy things but good can come from this so i thought that's that's and I, I went on a bit about that but i wanted to connect yeah. our first story for people who read it yeah so that that very helpfully sets up the the second question for you that i had in mind which is in, in what way is his response right into the camera and, and then the defenses he gives of it in what ways is it a, a christian response does he think he's being a christian poet in doing this so you've mentioned some of the the, the pros and cons about this, that he's trying to give solace to sequestered women. He's imagining a, a social order coming out of catastrophe in which there's more room for joy. Um, and there's even, uh, you know, one scholar I read who says that there, there's a kind of rise from the, some of the lower elements in the early stories toward at the end, this theme of magnanimity or a kind of humanity and charity that might be an ideal. Uh, then you've mentioned, on the other hand, so he's aware that it could be inter interpreted and criticized as sexually licentious, and it criticizes the church, and it criticizes social order. So where, which Boccaccio is the real Boccaccio? Is it both? Does he think he's a Christian writer? How do you, how do you fit this together? Well, that, that's a great question, and I think, I think the answer is yes, he thinks he's a Christian writer, partly because it's inconceivable for a 14th century Italian to not think that they're a Christian writer. Uh, one of the things I think about this sort of pre-Reformation period where you don't yet have a Protestant alternative to Catholicism and all the, the sort of disputes that gives rise to is that Christianity is the, is the sort of mental universe that 14th century Europeans live in. They know that there are people who are Muslim. They know that there are people who are Jewish. And, and Boccaccio takes account of these communities. But the vast majority of the, the whole culture is a Christian culture. And so... For example, uh, later readers would come to 14th century writers like Boccaccio and, and Chaucer and say, oh my God, look, they're, they're saying all these horrible things about friars. How can they, they must be, they must be proto-Protestants or they must, you know, they must hate the Catholic church or they must be making some kind of criticism of Christianity. And Boccaccio actually responds to this in, the, in, the, in his author's note at the end. He's like, no, I'm just criticizing friars. I'm not criticizing the church. No, no. I'm criticizing a particular group of people in the church who are liable for criticism because they're not living up to their, their ideals. And friars are, are um, particularly criticized in the 14th century. And I think the reasons for this are very specific. The, the, the mendicant orders, the begging orders, the friars come out of uh, the Fran they're the Franciscans and the Dominicans, and they come out in a, in a large way, especially in Italy, they come out of St. Francis. And the idea is that these are people who are going to reject the pomp of the church and take a vow of poverty and wear, you know, rough clothes, and they won't even have a belt. They'll tie their they'll tie their uh, tunic with a rope and things like this. And this was enormously popular, and that was in some ways their downfall. They were so popular that everyone gave them money, especially in wills. People would, the, the Franciscans were, you know, early on they were saying, should we even have a church? Well, they have the, the, the most beautiful church in 14th century Italy is in Assisi because they got so much money from all the people who wanted to support their holy poverty, which meant that in practice, they often weren't particularly poor. And yet they pretended to be poor or they went out saying they were poor or the whole public image of the friars. So they, they got a bad reputation in the 14th century for hypocrisy, that they were claiming to be poor and that they weren't really. The thing that helped encourage this was that friars weren't attached to particular churches. They would beg in, an, in neighborhoods. Well, what this meant in practice is the friar would be knocking on doors asking for money in the middle of the day when the men were out at work and the women were alone in the house. This leads to the cliche of the lustful friar who is having an affair with the wife while the husband's hard at work in the fields. Uh, 
if you think of the most famous friar in the English tradition, it's got to be Friar Tuck in uh, the Robin Hood legend. Friar Tuck is everything a friar shouldn't be. He's living with a bunch of outlaws. He's fat. How did he get fat? He got fat from eating a lot. How did he get a lot of food? He's supposed to be poor. And uh, a lot of Americans don't realize tuck is English slang. It means grub, uh, you know, food, chow. He's Friar Chow. Uh, so the idea is that friars aren't living up. And Boccaccio, like everyone else in the 14th century, sees no problem attacking friars. In fact, that's a godly thing to do because they're being hypocritical. They're not living up to their vows of poverty. Um, the other thing I think to put the sort of question about Boccaccio's religion, and there's a couple of other things to put it in context. Uh, Boccaccio, the sin that he deals with most often is probably lust. And lust is seen in Dante as the least serious of the serious sins. It's a serious sin, but it's the least serious. It's the first thing to be punished at the top level of hell, and it's the very last thing that you do penance for in purgatory. The reason for this is that uh, sexual desire is seen as a natural urge given to you by God, but perverted through the fall of Adam and Eve. And that means that sexual desire is often misdirected as, as far as the church is concerned. But philosophically, the idea is that misdirecting an animal urge is a relatively minor sin compared with lying, which is a misdirection of your reason, which is a distinctly human category. In other words, reason is a higher social, a higher mental and spiritual function than sexual desire. So using your reason for evil is worse than using your sexual desire for evil, which I think is a different way of thinking about, you know, sort of relative sinfulness uh, than, than more modern takes on this. Uh, and so in that sense, um, you know, the Boccaccio and that, you know, lust is not that serious. It's not that much of a focus for sin. Pride is the, the worst sin. Uh, and that is, that is going to be something that gets dealt with more harshly than that. Lust. The other thing to look at, and I haven't done this systematically, but some of the most lustful tales involve people who aren't Christian. Yeah. In other words, they're sort of put, uh, there's, there's one story, it's a, it's a very ironic and very long story. I think it's in the second book. Uh, and it's a, it's an Arab story about a woman. She's engaged to be married and she's put on a boat by her dad and she goes sailing off in the Mediterranean. Right. Basically what happens is she ends up sleeping with nine different men, mostly through no fault or choice of her own. She's just kidnapped by pirates and then she's rescued by a knight and she ends up, you know, she ends up sleeping with all these different men. She has no choice of it. She's being forced to by all these men, but she, she goes along with it because it keeps her alive. And then at the end, she ends up miraculously sort of delivered to her bridegroom. And the idea is all's well that ends well. Don't ask too many questions and, and so on. She's explicitly in that story, not a Christian. So the question about her salvation, uh, you know, she's, she's not within the, the group of the saved anyway. So you can sort of, it gives it a bit of distance. Some of the more licentious stories, there's, a, there's one in book four or five that's particularly um, got censored in the later editions. And it's a Muslim girl who, who falls in with a Muslim holy man. And he, he basically seduces her by giving her all these lies about, oh, you have to go through this ritual to, you know, keep the devil away. And basically he's seducing her, he's taking advantage of her. Uh, and again, that's not a Christian woman who, and not a Christian holy man. So there are, there are these distancing things. So I think that, that sort of puts it in context. The last thing I'll say is that Boccaccio himself says, look, these are 20 year olds in a garden. They're not philosophers. They're not theologians. Uh, it's a generic thing. What are, what are young people in a garden going to talk about? They're going to talk about love. They're not going to be talking about theology and no one would believe them if they did. So we might get back to that garden, the garden uh, setting or metaphor, but I think we've got time for Teresa to ask her second question. And then reminder to everybody, you can send us questions through the Q&A function, type them in in uh, chat, in, in the Zoom Q&A. Teresa. Thank you. Yes. Well, just as Boccaccio's relationship with Christianity sometimes seems a little ambivalent, he was also known to be a transitional figure between the medieval and the modern worlds, or at least the Renaissance humanist world. And as a political theorist, I'm interested in applying this lens to the political founding that appears in the intro to day one, where out of concern for bodily self-preservation, the 10 young people consent to form a new society 
And then once they passed beyond the city's limits, they found a new political regime too. As you mentioned, all the members, men and women alike, democratically elect a monarch to determine the day's activities. And they decide that the royal office will then rotate to a different person each day. Now, I think that on one hand, you could read this political founding as strikingly modern. So when the plague strips away civic order, it reveals something like a lawless Habesian state of nature underneath. And maybe that social contract is also kind of quasi Habesian, a human artifice created by consent for purposes of comfortable self-preservation and utility. But on the other hand, the community clearly doesn't abandon the medieval world governed by divine and natural laws because the young people adhere to a traditional moral code. They're very concerned with the Ciceronian virtue of honestas, which is a kind of honesty or moral integrity. And they do seem to have this authentic friendship in the Aristotelian sense. So my question for you is, which of these interpretations do you find more accurate, the medieval or the modern? How do you see Boccaccio as operating as a operating as a transitional figure between these two worlds on questions of politics and ethics? Is he trying to subvert the customs of his day or preserve them? That's a, that's a great question, and I think I mean Boccaccio is Boccaccio is modern in that he's doing some very modern things. One of the modern things he's doing is he's endorsing the vernacular. He's not writing the Decameron in Latin. He's writing it in the vernacular. He says he's doing that so women can read it, which is also modern. He's thinking of a uh, of an audience of men and women for his text. He's not writing to an all male community. Um, very often when we find these texts that are that are very modern the people at the time would not have realized how modern they were. In other words, what they see is all the things that make them traditional and what we see is all the things that make them look, look like things that we're familiar with. And I think that fits with the Decameron. Um, it's obviously not something that Boccaccio stuck with the rest of his life. He spent the rest of his life writing Latin treatises about, you know, tales that everyone had, you know, Latin compendio, which is a very medieval thing to do. He, uh, he is a humanist in that he's actually reading Greek and he, he discovered a lot of, he did a lot of digging around for manuscripts, Latin manuscripts of, of neglected poets and things and discovered quite a few. Um, but I think the, the political question, I, I think that what's happening, what's happening in terms of Boccaccio, not in terms of the way we read it, what we see, but I think what's happening in terms of Boccaccio is this is a game. This is not the real world. This is, this is a holiday. This is a, you know, a holy day. It's, it's a day off. It's, a, it's time away. And they never plan to do it for any length of time. And in some ways, it's like Carnival before Lent. You break all the rules because you're getting outside of the normal thing. So you can put women in charge for a day. Or you can put women in charge for seven days. Uh, there's all this number symbolism, by the way, that we haven't gotten into with seven and three. Uh, these are all there and ten and nine, nine days plus one day. There's all this stuff and he's working with that. There's a reason there's seven women. There's a reason there's three men. Uh, there's a reason there's 10 of them all together. You know, I'm not sure we always know what the reason is, but there is a reason, it's not by chance. But it is a kind of structured place of play. And it, it follows too from a courtly love tradition. And that's part of why I, I was, I wanted to, to sort of make sure that people knew that he had written all these courtly love poems. He's coming out of this very kind of ritualized courtly love thing where the woman is the woman is in charge. The man is the humble servant who is begging the woman's favor. She is his lady, he serves her. None of this happens in real life, right? That's not the gender relations in, in real life in this society at all. But it's the, it's the make-believe ones in the world of love which is, you know, something that is in some ways detached from real life. One of the things to remember about courtly love is that it's courtly. Uh, peasants don't love people. Only noble people can love. Peasants just have kids. Uh, love is for noble people and noble souls. And there's a reason, too, that the 10 people are all well-born, well-behaved aristocrats. They're not... Uh, they're not a cross section. There's a cross section in the stories, but the storytellers are all very reputable, very refined people who can feel sort of elite feelings like love that only a noble soul could feel. 
uh, which is a kind of aristocratic refinement on sexual desire. Sexual desire is an animal thing, uh, but love is not just a human thing, it's an aristocratic thing. It's, be, it's above normal. And part of what's going on with the stories is they're making fun of the stupid way that non-noble people negotiate these things and the foolish things that they do and the way that, the way that love you know, makes, them, makes them foolish. Uh, so there is this kind of court of love. And the other thing, I, I think the other thing to remember when we're looking at it politically is that love is what women are supposed to be, that's their area of expertise, right? Uh, the men's area of expertise is warfare and to a lesser degree commerce, but men deal with violence, women deal with sex. Uh, and so they're in a female world. Uh, and th there's all this symbolism of that. The garden enclosed is a female symbol from the Bible. But they also, at one point, go to this magical place called the Valley of Ladies uh, and tell stories there. They're very much in a feminine space that's apart from the masculine space of politics. Uh, in Ciceronian terms, it's the private life as opposed to the public life. Uh, and that overlays in weird ways. But yeah, I, I think... But your question is a good one because having said all that about why it works out that way, when we look at it, we go, it looks like democracy, which is the last thing Boccaccio is thinking about. They, they're, these are aristocrats. They're not Democrats. The very best, they're oligarchs. I mean, they, and they, they have people waiting on them hand and foot who do not get to tell tales or, you know, sit under the trees and dance. They bring them the food and they cook the food and they make the beds. And, you know, all, they have all these servants to, to take care of that. Just so they can have this thing. One follow up, Ian, then we'll go to audience questions. We, we haven't mentioned the subtitle that he gave to this, and he refers to it in the author's conclusion, that it's a, it's a Prince Galahad tale, or Gal Galaho tale, um, about, which is a reference in a way to the Arthurian uh, legends of someone who is the go-between in, in a love affair, or maybe even an adulterous uh, uh, affair. So that would, that would refer to the courtly love, but it could have a double-edged meaning, couldn't it, about the role yeah, being that that's a that's an interesting term and it's interesting to me that he stresses it because that he knows from dante that's something he's pulling straight from the divine comedy there's a very famous couple of souls that uh dante meets very early on in hell and it's paolo and francesca and they're two young aristocrats who uh were left alone they they were reading and they were reading a story of arthurian romances and uh, while they're reading, they sort of notice that the other, each of them notices the other one is extremely attractive. And uh, as, uh, as Francesca says, we read no more that day. They put the book down. Uh, and, and blaming, you know, Dante is always asking the souls he meets, how'd you end up here? And she says, that book was a Galahad. In other words, it's the book's fault. And I don't, you know, I'm not sure we're supposed to think it was the book's fault. People are responsible for their actions. But it's interesting that that's the phrase that, that's in Dante, that book was a Galahad. And then Boccaccio says, this book is a Galahad. Uh, and I, I mean, I don't, you know, and it's interesting to me that he pushes that. Of course, the point with Paolo and Francesca is they stopped reading. <laughs> you shouldn't stop reading, you should keep reading. Uh, and and maybe reading will keep you from doing, right? I mean, that seems to be implicit in some of the things that, that uh, Boccaccio is saying is that, you know, read this, don't do this. We like that message about more reading. Uh, that's, yeah, that's yeah. Good. So uh, to our first <laughs> audience it. question, it's an anonymous question it's about our earlier discussion of, of whether he thinks of himself as a Christian poet and the, what kind of Christian message comes. Um, and the question is, if it, if he could see it or others saw it as a Christian book, why, why was it banned is the, is the question. Oh, that, that's a great question. And the answer is it wasn't banned at the time. It was banned later uh, in the, in the Counter-Reformation after there was Protestantism and the Catholic Church became much more defensive, uh, reasonably so. Uh, they began in the mid 16th century. So 200 years, 300 years after, uh, yeah, 300 years after, uh, Boccaccio, they drew up a list of books that were not to be read by good Catholics. And it was called the Index of Prohibited Books. And books could be put entirely on the index or sections of them could. Things could be published with excisions. 
Uh, I know in a case of Castiglione's Book of the Courtier, it was okay if you printed it, but all the jokes about friars had to be turned into jokes about Jews. Uh, there were, there were basically, they, they, they put limits on things that could be read, especially they weren't so much, even, even that though, even putting things on the index, very often sort of what we would consider sexually, um, you know, racy books were put on the index, but the usual reason wasn't the sexiness of the books. It was that the sex, it was implied that uh, religious people were engaging in this, that friars were seducing people. That was the thing that the church was really concerned about. Uh, that criticism of friars at the time when there was no alternative church, well, you know, the friars should get their house in order, but by the 16th century, criticism about friars is starting to turn people away from Catholicism and towards Luther and Calvinism and things like that. And they, they put a much tighter rein on it. That's not sort of, it's not in the house anymore. It's, it's sort of become a, a weapon from outside the church to attack the church. And, and so uh, I don't think anybody in the period of the 14th century had any serious concerns about banning the Decameron. Uh, it might've been seen as a book that was lighthearted or frivolous or whatever, uh, but it wasn't seen as something that needed to be prohibited. That was a later context. Okay, Teresa, your turn for a question from the audience. Yes, um, I have a question from a Sharon Dunn, who mm -hmm. asks, how would you compare Decam the Decameron's discussion of the plague to that of Daniel Defoe, if you're familiar with his work? She asks, what would you identify as key takeaways from both? Okay, I've never read Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, so I can't, I can't comment in detail, but I will, I will just point to the title of it. Defoe is writing a journal of the plague year, and he's writing in the 17th century where that kind of record of day-to-day -day life is done in a much more modern way than it was in the, in the 14th century. Uh, a writer like Boccaccio would not be primarily concerned to write an accurate record of their own experiences. Boccaccio never tells you what his experiences are of the plague. He just says, I am a worthy, I'm someone who can tell you about this because I saw it. But he doesn't, he doesn't say, on Tuesday I went out and, oh my God, what was in front of me when I walked out my door? He, he's not interested in that. And to be interested in that would be to be prideful. That would be calling attention to himself. What he needs to do is copy good accounts of the plague and show that he knows how to write one too. And he builds on it. And so it's not just plagiarism. But by the time of Defoe, you're getting actual eyewitness accounts and Defoe is working in a print culture where you have something like the beginnings of modern journalism, where it's like, I'm gonna tell you what really happened. Uh, this is the news, you know? Uh, and Boccaccio isn't, isn't writing in that kind of a context or for that kind of an audience, a much broader audience that Defoe is writing and in a much more modern way. But I'm afraid I haven't read that. So I can't, I can't make the, the detailed comparison. I should read it. <laughs> I should have time now, right? Because we're... <laughs> Um, I have a short question from the, um, the audience and a, and a longer one. The short one, do you recommend a particular translation or, or edition for people to read? I really like the Wayne Rebhorn translation, which is the one that we circulated the PDF. It's in the Norton. It was done in the last 10 years. I've, I've worked with Rebhorn. He's a very good scholar and I think he's a good translator. He also is very up to date and nuanced. Um, there are, uh, there are, you know, you can find 19th century translations of the Decameron online for free, which is useful, but they're very archaic and they're very, they, they write sort of, they're often written in the early 20th century and they're sort of a, a late Victorian version of what they think a medieval person should write like. So there's a lot of thou and thee and though. And uh, Rebhorn is much more meticulous about reproducing Boccaccio's style, which is, his style is interesting because in the, in the formal parts of the text, he can be enormously formal. In fact, the first couple of paragraphs of the introduction are almost unreadable. They're so Latinate. But then when you get into the tales, people often speak in the way that they would actually have spoken on the street to the point of sometimes speaking in dialect. Uh, so he's got an enormous range. And I think Rebhorn does a good job of, uh, of reproducing that in English. And I think he also is careful to sort of keep enough Italian that it seems Italian you know, for titles and things like that, uh, but to to make it understandable for a, a 21st century English reader, I, I that's the one I would read myself. Okay, and then a, a question um, from, it, uh, is it Asha uh, Inouye, 
um, the, the question you might expect, Ian, um, having thought a lot about Boccaccio yourself in the past and then currently in this uh, current uh, pandemic for America and globally, do you, do you, would you extract a lesson or two uh, that, that thinking about Boccaccio, thinking about the Decameron might provide about our societal response to this particular plague? What about social distancing? Um, we, we have a media phenomenon that, that Boccaccio doesn't talk about or probably didn't have in the same way. What, yeah, what, yeah. what ideas might you have uh, to apply Boccaccio more directly to our current circumstances? I, I find the Decameron a, a very encouraging text to be reading during the current crisis for a couple of reasons. One is what we're going through is horrible and difficult and should not be, you know, sort of underestimated or downplayed. But it's sometimes useful to remember that we've been through as a, as a civilization and as, a, as, as human beings, we've been through worse. The Black Death was worse uh, on a scale that's almost unimaginable. And that helps us sometimes put our, our own issues in perspective, which can help us get the strength to overcome them. If, if they came through that, we can come through this. The other thing is how does, you know, what does Boccaccio show us as being helpful? Creating community, uh, focusing on the positive, not on the negative, uh, doing what you can do. They, they are not doctors, they cannot cure the plague. What they can do, though, is keep each other's spirits up, keep them from despairing. Despair is a sin much worried about uh, because despair, dis despair is particularly evil in uh, medieval religious thought because it means you don't trust God anymore. It means you've lost, on some level, you've fundamentally lost faith if you despair because you have no more hope. And so uh, not to be harsh on people who are feeling <laughs> depressed, uh, but the idea that hope is hope is good, and you should you should have hope, you should have faith, uh, and that uh, and that you can use adversity to to bring creativity, not just personal creativity, but looking around. I mean, what Boccaccio does, he looks around his world and says, "What do we have here that's good? What do we have here that's funny? What do we have here that that you can learn from? What do we what do we?" What can I collect to, to sort of help me through this? And some of the stories are stories he makes up, but a lot of the stories are stories he finds. And he says, look at this, this is interesting. You can learn from this. Uh, and uh, doing that sort of creative thing to, to be able to sort of find a way to structure your life, to, to focus on things that are positive and things that you can learn from. I, I, I think that's, that's a wonderful thing to be doing now. Um, so, so that's what I would take. That is a great way to uh, unfortunately have to finish, uh, but fortunately finish on an on a interesting and constructive uh, note. So I, I do have a, a few general uh, remarks as we have to say goodbye to each other. Uh, of course, we're very happy to have so many people participating in this second uh, webinar uh, in the Pandemic Dialogues. And, um, Again, um, please check our website, scetl.asu.edu, for information on the upcoming webinar sessions. Our next two uh, will be on Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe, a short story he writes about a uh, plague, uh, and then a discussion of the uh, recent pop culture fascination with zombies and the zombie uh, apocalypse. Uh, also look for um, our podcast, part of the pandemic uh, dialogues discussing Camus, the plagues, uh, the plague. Um, you can look for that on iTunes, other podcast platforms. You can connect via Twitter with our two faculty colleagues, Luke Perez and Trevor Shelley, who are conducting that uh, conversation. Three episodes of that podcast now are posted on our website and are available uh, elsewhere in podcast land. Uh, and you can also on our website find a recording of the Thucydides webinar we've already completed. Uh, and in a day or so, you could look for uh, and share with, with uh, friends and colleagues a recording of this uh, Boccaccio uh, webinar. Uh, with that, I should thank our uh, faculty and staff colleagues here in the school who made this webinar uh, possible. Dr. Carol McNamara, our Associate Director for Public Programs, Dr. Luke Perez, Joe Martin, our Communications Manager, and Morgan Raddick from our event staff. Uh, we are again very grateful to our guest, Professor Ian Moulton here at ASU, and also I'm grateful to my colleague, 
uh, Teresa Smart. With that, thank you everyone for joining us and be well and good night.